From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! And I can see the sky above me. The ceiling has fell off my room. Wow. And for uh, like a minute, I really felt that I had a nightmare. I was in a dream. I did not realize what has just happened. But then uh, I looked left to my wife. I could not see her. I did not see her. All I saw was debris. Some parts of the ceiling had broken and fell on her. So all I see was cement and concrete blocks. I did not see her. Basim Rasso lost his wife, his daughter, his brother, and his nephew in a U.S. airstrike in 2015 in Mosul, Iraq. Coalition video of the strike shows a target hit with military precision. Today, we speak with Bassem and the co-authors of a damning New York Times investigation called The Uncounted that reveals U.S. airstrikes against Islamic militants in Iraq have killed far more civilians than anyone has acknowledged, as survivors are left to wonder why their families were targeted. We went to the sites of more than 103 airstrikes in different areas of Iraq, parts that were formerly held by ISIS, and cased each to figure out where every airstrike happened. What we found was that one in five resulted in a civilian death. This is 31 times higher than the figures the government uses. We'll speak with reporters Asmat Khan and Anand Gopal, co-authors of The New York Times Investigation. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. CBS News has suspended Charlie Rose, and PBS and Bloomberg TV have stopped airing The Charlie Rose Show, after eight women accused the famous TV broadcaster of sexual harassment, including groping them, making lewd phone calls, walking around naked or in an untethered bathrobe. One former intern for Charlie Rose, named Rhea Bravo, told The Washington Post in its exposé that Rose repeatedly walked around naked in front of her and repeatedly groped her, including one time when he, quote, grabbed me by my hair, holding a fist of it at the base of my scalp, unquote. Another time, she says, they were traveling on a small private plane when he got out of his seat and lay on top of her, pressing his body into hers. Other women accused Rose of forcefully touching or trying to touch them without their consent. One woman describes being in the midst of a job hiring process with Charlie Rose, having already been told salary and job title when he took her out to his Bellport, Long Island estate. After sitting by the pool late at night with her, he returned naked in an open bathrobe and proceeded to force his hands down her pants. According to the Washington Post exposé, a number of people at The Charlie Rose Show knew about Rose's alleged sexual harassment, including the longtime producer Yvette Vega. The Post spoke to over 20 people for the article, and at least a dozen more women have come forward to The Post since the article was published yesterday. In response to the investigation, Charlie Rose said, quote, I deeply apologize for my inappropriate behavior, unquote. This is Gail King, his co-anchor of the CBS This Morning show. I'm really struggling, because how do you, what do you say when someone that you deeply care about has done something that is so horrible? How do you wrap your brain around that? I'm really grappling with that. Um, that said, Charlie does not get a pass here. He doesn't get a pass from anyone in this room. We are all deeply affected. That was Gail King, Charlie Rose's co-host on CBS This Morning. The shocking Washington Post investigation is the latest of a series of sexual harassment revelations to upend the media, journalism and political worlds in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal, who is now being criminally investigated after dozens of women came forward to accuse him of rape, assault and sexual harassment. The New York Times has suspended prominent investigative reporter Glenn Thrush after multiple women told the website Vox that Thrush had forcibly touched them or kissed them without their consent. A second woman has accused Minnesota Senator Al Franken of groping her, saying Franken grabbed her buttocks at the Minnesota State Fair in 2010, two years after Franken was elected to the Senate. 
And in breaking news, Michigan Congressman John Conyers settled a sexual harassment complaint in 2015, paying out $27,000 to a woman who alleged she was fired from his Washington staff because she rejected his sexual advances. Congressman Conyers is the top Democrat on the House Judiciary Committee. Hundreds of farm workers and their supporters rallied Monday night outside the Manhattan offices of Wendy's board chairman, Nelson Peltz, to protest sexual harassment, assault and violence in the tomato fields. The coalition of Immokalee workers are demanding Wendy's sign on to the fair food program aimed at protecting farm workers' rights, including the right to work without sexual harassment and assault, which has been pervasive in the agriculture industry. This is farm worker Luke we are demanding that Wendy sign an agreement to guarantee human rights for farm workers, and in particular, the rights of women working in the fields. For the first time in history, we as farm worker women are living a new day, an opportunity to work in the fields free from sexual harassment. But Wendy's, instead of joining the Fair Food Program to eliminate sexual harassment and violence against women in the fields, has decided to move its tomato purchases to Mexico, where this violence is Endemic. The White House appears to be continuing to endorse Alabama Republican Senate candidate Roy Moore, despite the fact that nine women have accused Moore of sexually harassing or assaulting them when they were teenagers. The New Yorker magazine reports Moore was banned from a local mall and a YMCA in Alabama because he repeatedly badgered teenage girls, in some cases soliciting sex from young girls. This is senior White House aide Kellyanne Conway bashing Moore's opponent Doug Jones in an interview with Fox News. Jones in Alabama, folks, don't be fooled. He'll be a vote against tax cuts. He's weak on crime, weak on borders. He's strong on raising your taxes. He's terrible for property owners. So and Doug Roy Jones Moore? is a doctrinaire liberal, which is why he's not saying anything and why the media are right. trying to boost him. So vote Roy Moore? I'm telling you that we want the votes in in the in the Senate to get this tax this tax bill through. That's Kellyanne Conway, a Trump aide, speaking on Fox News. In its latest immigration crackdown, the Trump administration has announced it will revoke special immigration program for nearly 60,000 Haitians, including many who came to the United States after the devastating 2010 earthquake in Haiti. The Trump administration now says their temporary protected status, or TPS, will end in July of 2019. This is Marlene Bastien, executive director of Haitian Women of Miami, speaking on Democracy Now! earlier this year. It is in the best interest, the national interest of the U.S. for the 50,000 plus Haitians to remain here, continue to contribute socially, financially, and otherwise, and then keep these remittances flowing so that people will not risk their lives to come here as a result of these, uh, you know, waves of deportation. You can see the full interview at democracynow.org. Meanwhile, a federal judge in California has blocked President Trump's executive order to withhold funding from so-called sanctuary cities. District Judge William Oreck ordered the injunction after ruling it's unconstitutional for the Trump administration to force cities to mobilize local police to cooperate with the federal government's mass deportation plans. In more immigration news, the Trump administration has asked the U.S. Supreme Court to allow Trump's latest travel ban to take effect, following an appeals court ruling last week that blocked part of it from being enacted. This latest travel ban removed Sudan from the original list and added the countries of Chad and North Korea and some government officials from Venezuela. The latest order also includes restrictions on citizens from Iraq, as well as all citizens of Iran, Libya, Syria, Yemen and Somalia. Nebraska regulators have approved the controversial Keystone XL pipeline, dealing a blow to the nearly decade-long battle to stop the project. On Monday, regulators rejected TransCanada's preferred route, but approved an alternative path for the pipeline, which would link up with an existing network to carry oil from Canada's tar sands region in Alberta to refineries as far away as the Gulf of Mexico. Opponents say the Keystone XL pipeline threatens to pollute 
pollute Nebraska's Oglala Aquifer while accelerating greenhouse gas emissions from oil extracted in Canada's tar sands region. Monday's approval comes only days after, in South Dakota, TransCanada was forced to shut part of its Keystone I pipeline after a massive rupture spilled 210,000 gallons of oil into a nearby field. President Trump has officially designated North Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism, escalating the rising tensions between the two countries. Other countries on the list are Sudan, Syria and Iran. The diplomatic move comes amidst an escalating threat of nuclear war, with Trump repeatedly threatening to totally destroy North Korea and to unleash fire and fury on the nation of 25 million people. This is Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. I call it the peaceful pressure campaign. The president calls it the maximum pressure campaign, so there's no confusion. They're one and the same. Uh, and I think this is, though, to hold North Korea accountable for a number of actions that they've taken. In news on the U.S. war in Afghanistan, the U.S. Air Force is on track to triple the number of bombs there dropped this year, compared with last year. The major increase in bombing comes as the Trump administration's deployed thousands more U.S. troops to Afghanistan in recent months. By early 2018, there are slated to be about 16,000 U.S. troops there. The ongoing U.S. war in Afghanistan is the longest war in U.S. history. Meanwhile, the U.S. military has also sharply increased bombing in Somalia in recent days. The New York Times reports the U.S. has carried out at least five drone strikes since November 9th, killing at least 40 people, whom the Pentagon claims are militants with al-Shabaab. This comes as a new report from Brown University's Cost of War Project estimates the U.S. wars since the 9-11 attacks in 2001 will cost up to $8 trillion in interest payments alone over the coming decades. The report says the U.S. has already spent $4.3 trillion on the wars and that the U.S. will be paying trillions of dollars in interest on the war debt for decades to come. In Nigeria, a suicide bombing at a mosque in the northeast has killed up to 50 people. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack. The local officials blamed it on Boko Haram. In Zimbabwe, longtime leader Robert Mugabe is continuing to refuse to resign amidst an escalating political standoff in the country. Zimbabwe's ruling party is expected to begin impeachment proceedings today. Last week, Mugabe was placed under house arrest after Zimbabwe's military seized parliament, courts, government offices and the capital's main airport in an apparent coup. Robert Mugabe has held power since Zimbabwe declared independence from Britain 37 years ago. On Monday, students went on strike, boycotting their exams and calling for Mugabe to step down. Until Robert Mugabe resigns, we are not going to write an exam. No one is going to write an exam. This university is going to be declared closed until Robert Mugabe comes to a point, comes to his senses, where students are saying, Robert Mugabe is over. We want a new president. Back in the United States, the head of Puerto Rico's electric power agency, known as PREPA, has resigned, as half the island still has no electricity two months after Hurricane Maria. Ricardo Ramos had faced widespread outrage for signing a $300 million contract with the tiny Montana-based company Whitefish, named after the hometown of Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke. Whitefish is now threatening to sue PREPA, Puerto Rico's electrical power agency, claiming the power authority owes the company $83 million. The Justice Department has sued to block a proposed $85 billion merger between AT&T and Time Warner, setting the stage for one of the biggest antitrust lawsuits in decades. The merger would give AT&T control over Warner Brothers film and television studios, along with CNN, TNT, HBO and many other brands. Many say the Justice Department lawsuit could be politically motivated, as it comes after President Trump has spent months threatening and disparaging CNN, which is owned by Time Warner. The Federal Communications Commission's chairman, Ajit Pai, is expected to announce today a sweeping plan to repeal 
all net neutrality rules. The rules were adopted in 2015 to keep the Internet open and prevent corporate service providers from blocking access to websites, slowing down content, or providing paid fast lanes for Internet service. The new plan to scrap those rules is expected to be voted on during a December meeting of FCC commissioners. And people gathered in cities across the United States and the world on Monday for the annual Transgender Day of Remembrance. At least 25 transgender people have been murdered so far this year in the United States, the majority of whom were black and tra black trans women. Across the world, more than 300 trans people have been reported murdered so far this year. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Today, we spend the hour looking at a damning new report that reveals how U.S.-led airstrikes against Islamic State militants in Iraq have killed far more civilians than officials have acknowledged. The on the ground investigation by The New York Times magazine titled The Uncounted found the actual civilian death toll may be 31 times higher than the U.S. is admitting. In fact, the report reveals that as many as one in five coalition airstrikes on ISIS targets in Iraq resulted in civilian deaths. The reporters write, quote, in terms of civilian deaths, this may be the least transparent war in recent American history. The investigation comes as U.S. military officials continue to insist coalition bombing in Iraq has been precise in hitting its targets. This is Army Lieutenant General Stephen J. Townsend. I reject uh, any notion that uh, coalition fires were in, in any way imprecise, uh, unlawful. Uh, or excessively targeted uh, civilians. I would argue that this is, uh, I believe, the most precise uh, campaign in the history of warfare. And we have gone to extraordinary measures to safeguard uh, civilian lives. But the New York Times investigation reveals many of the American-led airstrikes against Islamic State militants actually killed civilians. One of the survivors they interviewed, Bassem Razo, described a coalition airstrike on his home in Mosul, Iraq, in 2015, in which his wife, daughter, brother and nephew were killed. Video of the strike on his home shows a target hit with military precision. Well, today we're joined by that man, Bassem Razo. He's joining us from Erbil, Iraq, via Democracy Now! video stream. We're also joined in our studio here in New York by the two reporters who co-authored this New York Times investigation headlined The Uncounted. Asma Khan is an investigative journalist and a Future of War fellow at New America and Arizona State University. And Anand Gopal is an assistant research professor at Arizona State University and the author of No Good Men Among the Living. I want to start off in Erbil, Iraq, with Bassem Razo. Bassem, that's not actually your longtime home. Um, you lived in Mosul until 2015. Can you describe what happened on that fateful night when your home was hit by a U.S. airstrike? Good morning, Amy. Uh, thank you for having me on your program. Uh, that night, as I said in uh, my story, I went to bed around one o'clock. Uh, I had just checked my daughter to see if she has a sleep, and I lie down. And then I woke up uh, to a devastating explosion. Uh, did not realize what had happened. I felt that I was in a nightmare. Uh, but then I felt that something had happened because I looked up to the skies and I could see the stars. Uh, there was a terrible smell in the air. And then uh, I started feeling my legs, pinching myself. I thought I was in a dream or in a nightmare, but no, it was reality. I looked to the left at my wife and all I could see was debris. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started shouting her name, Mayada, Mayada. She did not answer me. I started shouting at my daughter, Tuqa, no answer. And then I started shouting at my brother's house. 
uh, but I could not hear a sound. Uh, minutes later, I could hear a sound from far away. And it seems that it was the groundkeeper that we have. His house was about 500 meters from my house. Uh, minutes later, he started shouting at me. He said, Uncle Basim, Uncle Basim, I'm coming, I'm coming, but I need to get a ladder so I can climb up. Are you okay? I said to him, his name is Saad. I said, Saad, please help me. I think I'm very uh, hurt and uh, something is broken. I cannot move. Uh, I had to try to stand up, but uh, I fell down. Uh, I reached to my back because I felt my back was warm and uh, I touched my back and then I looked, I felt something in my uh, left arm, something was warm and it, it was blood. My back has been injured. Uh, my left foot uh, had broken. My bed was in a V shape, which resulted in a break to my hip. Uh, I tried to just move a little bit, uh, but I could not move at all. So uh, minutes later, I could hear our groundkeeper climbing up to me. And then he came to me, he said, uh, are you okay, are you okay? I said, I'm, I'm badly hurt. What's happened to the other house? That was my brother's house. He said, I don't know, but I could hear a female sound. And then when I started shouting at her, it was my sister-in-law, Azza. And she said, Basim, everybody's gone. But I could not see anything. It was very dark. The Mbobing has uh, uh, damaged the electricity. The street was dark. Everything was dark. And then uh, about uh, half an hour later, I could see uh, somebody was walking, entering the farm with a torchlight. And they climbed up the, stair the ladder. And uh, three members of ISIS were looking down at me. So the first thing I said to them, I said, are you happy? They looked at me in disgust and they left me. They climbed down the ladder and they left. Uh, but they had called an ambulance, uh, but they did not let the ambulance come right away because usually when there is a bombing, uh, most of the time it's followed by a second bombing. So they wanted to stay out. So they left me for another like 15 minutes and then when they could hear that the planes were out of the sky, they ordered the ambulance to enter my farm. Uh, and uh, they took me down, put me on the ambulance, and they rushed me to the hospital. Uh, when I reached the hospital, it was chaos. Uh, I, did, I was disoriented. I don't know what was happening. I was in pain. And then... Uh, I looked around and I could not know anybody. It's, it was all ISIS members, but uh, somebody, some person, he tapped on my shoulder. He said, Uncle Basim, don't worry. Uh, I know Yahya, my uh, uh, son. He said, I will be here for you. Don't worry, don't worry. So he started rushing me. He gave me, he cleaned my wound in my back. They did some x-rays for me. They, they did a CT scan for, they were afraid that I have like a brain damage or hemorrhage. But thank God I did not have anything. They put a cast on my left foot. And then uh, I woke up the next morning around 10 with my uh, brother-in-law and another friend. And they had told me what just happened. They told me that all my member family are gone. Basim Rasa, our deepest condolences to you and, and your family. I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned that your brother's house was next door. Uh, how many total members of the, of the family were in both houses, and what was—how uh, many survived, and what kind of injuries did they have? Okay, in my house, it was me, my wife, and my daughter. Uh, two uh, lost their life, my wife and my daughter. In my brother's house, which was about like uh, 20 feet away from my house, uh, it was my brother, his wife, and his son. Uh, only his wife survived. So total, four deaths, two survivals. And 
Can you describe the last day with your wife and your daughter? Well, uh, usually before ISIS, I could come home late, like 10, 11 o'clock. But since ISIS entered Mosul, uh, it was for me, it's better for me and more comfortable for me to be home early. I will sit with my family, sit my, with my brother's family after sundown. We'll go out to the farm. So it was just a regular every day. I'll come home from work around 5 or 6. Uh, you had had a I'll party the night before at your brother's house? Yeah, we had a party, like a, like a party for women, and uh, my daughter and my wife attended that party. Uh, and, that, and then uh, we'll just have tea, and then when it's, and it's sundown, when the, the temperature cools down a little bit, uh, because, you know, it was September, hot, it was very hot in September in Iraq. So about eight or nine, we will just go out to the, to the front yard. We'll have... Uh, tea, maybe some cold drinks, maybe we'll have some fruits. And then we would stay late until like 10, 11. Uh, and that was my hours before my accident. And, and you, you, your mention of the strike, how often were these uh, airstrikes uh, visited on, the, on uh, Mosul or on your, uh, your neighborhood in particular? Were, they, were these regular occurrences or this was an unusual occurrence in your neighborhood? Well, at that time, uh, there was not that much bombing uh, before the liberation of Mosul. The, you, will, you will hear some bombing every now and then, but it was not that often. But you could hear drones in the sky, but for bombing, it was not that often. There's a picture in the New York Times investigation of your daughter, Tuka, on the night before the airstrike. She's got a, that sparkler you describe. Uh, yes, she she had found it somewhere. I think it was, uh, I don't know, we had bought it earlier uh, for her birthday, but it was left somewhere, and she had found it, and she lit it, and I was shouting at her because it was dangerous to light it inside. I told her, Toka, honey, why don't you go outside? She said, no, it's not working. I think it's damaged because of the humidity, so it's not sparkling that uh, much, so I'll be safe, I'll be safe. So uh, thank God it, it was she was safe. But uh, she lost her life later. Huh. We're going to break and then come back and hear what happened next. Has the U.S. claimed responsibility for what it did to your family? And we'll be joined by the two reporters who've investigated the attack on not only your home and your brothers, um, but so many others in Mosul, Iraq. Uh, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, and investigated airstrikes throughout Iraq. Please stay with us. Arda River Song by Osama Shalabi and Stefan Christoph. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're spending the hour looking at a New York Times investigation that reveals many of the American-led airstrikes against Islamic State militants actually killed civilians. One of the survivors, the reporters interviewed by Simrazo, described a coalition airstrike on his home in Mosul, Iraq, in 2015, in which his wife, daughter, brother and nephew were killed. Video of the strike on his home shows a target hit with military precision. 
Basim Razo is just joining us, and you've heard a part of his story in our last segment, as he speaks to us from Erbil, Iraq, via Democracy Now! video stream. And we're joined in our New York studio by the two reporters who co-authored the New York Times investigation headlined The Uncounted. It was the cover story of The New York Times magazine this past mm -hmm. Sunday. Asmat Khan, investigative journalist and a Future of War fellow at New America and Arizona State University, and Anand Gopal, assistant research professor at Arizona State University and the author of the book, No Good Men Among the Living. Asmat Khan, um, talk about the U.S. figures for how many civilians have died, how many airstrikes, how many civilians killed, and then what you found. So, the coalition, which is led by the United States, releases monthly civilian casualty figures. Our analysis of them shows that they have admitted to 466 Iraqi civilian deaths in 89 airstrikes. This is of more than 14,000 that they've carried out in Iraq, which is an incident rate of 0.6 percent, less than 1 percent. What we less found— Less than 1 percent civilian killed. Less than 1 percent, exactly, 0.6 percent. What we found is that one in five airstrikes or 31 times as high, resulted in civilian death. And your analysis is based not, obviously, on all the 14,000, but you investigated about 100 and th 103 uh, separate incidents. Because 14,000 over roughly a four-year period, we're talking about 100 airstrikes a day, <laughs> on average, that were occurring in Iraq uh, in this war against ISIS. Yeah. Many of these airstrikes took place uh, near or at around the time of liberation, but they were ongoing throughout. And so we saw an escalation around the time that Mosul or parts of Mosul were retaken. Taken. Uh, but you're basically looking at our sample, which was in East Mosul. It was in a, in a neighborhood called Aden, uh, a town that's um, so in East Mosul is relatively an urban, densely packed neighborhood. Uh, next, we had like a suburban municipality called Kayara, and after that, we had uh, downtown Shora, which is probably a small settlement tr typical of many ISIS held areas. And in each of these 103 strikes, you actually went on the ground to interview people who were there at the time to find out what happened. Exactly. So I've been to the site of every single one. We interviewed hundreds of survivors. We excavated the rubble. We looked for any presence of ISIS, whether that was in ISIS propaganda materials, uh, weaponry. Uh, we analyzed bomb fragments. We analyzed satellite imagery before and after in order to assess the date ranges of when these airstrikes had happened. We also checked all of the civilian casualty allegations with local administrators, health officials or law enforcement. Anand Gopal, um, how does the U.S. military gather its numbers? Well, most of these numbers come from internal reports by the U.S. military itself. For example, if uh, they notice a mission irregularity, if, uh, for, let's say, a pilot is dropping a bomb and all of a sudden uh, a civilian vehicle appears after the bomb is dropped, they'll report that to their superiors and, and oftentimes they'll investigate that. Occasionally, they get reports from uh, outside sources, from the media, from uh, Air Wars, which is a great organization that tracks these things. But they tend, more often than not, to, to actually discount those reports. And it's their own internal reports that they take the most seriously, which is why the number is so low. 466 civilians killed and 14,000 airstrikes would, if that was true, it would make it the most precise air war in the history of humanity. Um, but it's because uh, the the threshold for what qualifies as evidence for being a, a, a civilian is extremely, extremely high. So, in practice, people like Bossom are, in fact, uh, guilty until proven innocent. So, is Bossom included in this count of civilians, even the far lower count that the U.S. military has? Well, initially he wasn't, and a large part of our investigation was to to press that point. Um, his his family members were not counted; um, they were listed as ISIS, basically. Um, after the airstrike in his house, uh, the coalition put up a video of the strike, claiming that it was a IED factory, a car bomb factory, essentially. And so you could you could have gone on YouTube and found the the video of the bombing that destroyed his family for over a year. And it was only after we found this and and sort of showed this to the coalition, that they kind of t took it off YouTube. And eventually, after a long process of hundreds of emails and back and forth, did they admit that they killed uh, his family and that they were civilians, and they were eventually added to the count. So today, they're part of the count, but uh, 
they have they hadn't been for many years. Now this this issue of the preciseness of these strikes, which the military is always touting that uh, they hit exactly what they're looking for. You, you, your report suggests that the problem is not so much in the munitions themselves, but in the intelligence of what are the targets that they actually strike. That is faulty intelligence. Could you talk about that? Well, that's right. And in fact, uh, uh, talking about precision in, in some ways is a sleight of hand because, and in fact, it's true. They are very precise. They hit exactly what they intend to hit. The question is, what do they think they're hitting? Um, and the intelligence is often so poor. And again, it's, it goes back to this issue of Iraqis having to prove that they're not ISIS, which is uh, the opposite of what we would think. We'd think that they would, they would do the work, the coalition would do the work to find out whether somebody is a member of ISIS or not. Essentially, they assume people are ISIS until proven otherwise, and that's what uh, leads to this uh, extremely high count. Mm. Uh, Bas Marazzo, I wanted to go back to you. Uh, now you're in Erbil. Um, your home is in Mosul. You went to um, Western Michigan University uh, in Michigan, here in the United States? Yes, I was at Western Michigan. I graduated in 1988 in a degree with uh, industrial engineering, BSc. And you traveled with your wife in a sort of love journey across the country? Yeah, that was in 1982 when she joined me. And uh, we went for like a honeymoon for about 40 days around the United States in my car. So you moved home to Mosul. Um, your family was killed in 2015. And what has been your interaction with the U.S. military? Well, first, uh, when I was in Turkey for my operation, I received uh, a text on my Viber from the you know, American embassy in Baghdad saying that they would like to contact me. And uh, I text them back. I told them I was in Turkey and I will uh, get in touch with them as soon as I, I'm back in Baghdad. Uh, I returned uh, late, uh, about December, and then uh, I texted them and then they they gave me uh, an appointment to meet with them in February. Uh, that's when I visited the American Council in Baghdad, and uh, I had gathered the, some report. I wrote down the report. I gathered some uh, pictures, uh, some uh, aerial shots of my farm, and then I went to the embassy. I uh, submitted the report to them, and uh, the woman who interviewed me, she told me that they will have to uh, make sure that my allegations were right and that they will uh, pass my information to the DOD for verification. And then uh, I never heard from them for like two months. I emailed them back and uh, the lady said, we still have not heard anything from them. And uh, nothing for months until uh, about like five, six months later, I emailed them a letter and it was returned uh, the saying the mix, the mailbox is full. That's when I started doubting that there was something is going on. And then that's when I really met Azmet. And then things started rolling from there. The reporter who did this amazing piece, along with Anand Gopal for The New York Times. So, um, can you describe your meeting when you went to the, what, U.S. Embassy in, was it Baghdad? Um, and tell us what you were demanding and what it was that they gave you. OK, when I submitted my report, uh, she looked at it, and then she took it. She went inside into a room, and she came back like 15 minutes later. Uh, I had I had, in my report, I had demanded that first and most important thing to me was for them to state clearly that this bombing is a mistake. This is just to clear my name. And so I can uh, no longer be afraid to go back to Mosul uh, because at that time I was labeled as ISIS. Uh, my second demand was for them to compensate me uh, for uh, the losses of my family. I demanded compensation for my injury. Uh, I had lost my job because of my injury. So this was basically my demands in my uh, report that I submitted. And what was their response? Uh, well, it took them months and months to, it, if it wasn't for uh, Azmat's pushing, and then they they offered me, uh, first they admitted that the bombing was done by mistake, but this took 
months and months of emails back and forth, they still have not provided me with a clear letter saying that the bombing was done by mistake. And then uh, they gave me an appointment to meet in Erbil to offer me a payment, they call it Solasia payment. Uh, when I met with them at uh, Erbil airport, uh, this uh, lady lawyer, she, she expressed uh, her sorrow and deepest sympathy to my accident. And she said, we are sorry, we know the bombing was done by mistake. And I, the, for the second time and third time, I asked her, I said, listen, I need an explicit letter from you saying that the bombing then was done by mistake. She said, okay, I promise I will get you this letter. Uh, and then they offered me uh, the payment of $15,000 as a compensation for the death of uh, my wife and my daughter which I uh, immediately declined. And she said, I'm sorry, sir, this is the most that we can do and we're tapped off. Uh, and then I asked her for one more uh, request. My farm has been ransacked by uh, government officials. I cannot, tell, cannot say who, because there were so many uh, government agencies that entered Mosul and liberated Mosul being the uh, the army, the federal uh, units, the Hashid, I don't know, but they entered my farm and they have ransacked it and they have stolen so many things. And I said, listen, lady, I need you to help me get a word to the whoever is in charge of that area that stop anybody from entering the premises. And she also promised that she will get in touch through the American forces with the local commanders to stop anybody from entering. But this has not happened. Actually, till about uh, three weeks ago, they have entered the premises again, and they have stolen more material from a storage that we have. Uh, uh, so I, they, have, they have not offered me anything till now. I wanted to ask uh, Asma Khan, uh, this is a family that's a professional family, well-educated, was relatively middle class, and uh, there are many others uh, who are victims who are not so fortunate and don't have the ability to really confront the, uh, the, uh, the coalition. Uh, you, you talk about one case in April of 2015 where 18 civilians were killed and where the coalition is still saying there's insufficient evidence that any, uh, that any civilians were killed in that attack. What is happening with all these other cases? Right. That, that particular incident was an electrical substation in East Mosul, for which there was ample evidence of online. When I went on the ground and interviewed people, dozens of people, they said, just go online, you'll find the videos. And I did. They showed children uh, who were maimed and hurt. Some of their legs were blown off. These, these young, young children, boys and girls, there's no doubt about whether or not they are civilians. And so this was readily available to the coalition. But in the coalition's own assessment of this incident, they concluded there was insufficient evidence. Um, now, to speak to this excellent point about how so many survivors that, that I've met really don't have the resources or access or networks in the way that Bassem did to, for example, arrange an appointment at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. What I found repeatedly were people who couldn't even afford to rebuild their homes, some people who couldn't afford to even seek necessary medical treatment. One family in Mosul um, had three injured. They lost eight, eight individuals in an airstrike uh, in last November in, in East Mosul. And what they told me was that we're still injured, and the, the women, you know, they took me to a room in the back, and, and one woman revealed her headscarf and pulled open a cap, and you could actually see the skull on her you could see the skull visible from the top. Um, another woman, her hand, She'd had no medical treatment since She'd the... had no medical treatment. She, they needed really expensive surgeries. And when, you know, ultimately what we did is we provided all of the coordinates uh, of these airstrikes to uh, both the coalition and, and to the U.S. Air Force after we had visited the base in Qatar, where many of these aircraft take off from. Uh, what they told us in the case of, for example, the, the incident I just described to you with these, with these injured women who could not afford medical treatment treatment was that, in that case, they had conducted an airstrike just meters away on that day. So this is very likely a coalition airstrike. And these individuals, who often don't even have cell, phone li cell phones that are working all of the time, have very little means and access. And we've now turned over all of those allegations that were close to where uh, the coalition reported coordinates to us. 
and we're waiting to hear a response to them about whether or not they're even going to investigate them. And, Asma, when you went, uh, when, Bas when Basim went to uh, the U.S. Um, uh, lawyer and he laid out, you know, all he'd lost, this is outside of the agony of the loss of his family, his wife, his daughter, his nephew, <laughs> deeply close to him and his brother next door. Um, talked about what the houses are worth. He owns a downtown building in Mosul, mm -hmm. said something like $500,000. Um, and then they said altogether $15,000 if they sign, if he signs on the dotted line. How common is this? And, I mean, he's talking about even mm -hmm. this wouldn't have happened, mm -hmm. though he's not gotten a letter that he's not part of ISIS, even mm -hmm. if they say it to him mm -hmm. privately. How typical is this? So this is one of two condolence payment offers that have made have been offered in this entire anti-ISIS air war. So since August 2014, and some 27,000 uh, airstrikes in both Iraq and Syria, this is one of two offers. This is the only offer that was made for a civilian death. The other offer that was made was for. Uh, a damage to a car in a separate airstrike, but not for a civil. And so Boston— How has much has been allocated? So every year, for the last two years, Congress has authorized $5 million in funds to be used for payments like these. There have only been two offers made. Bassem is the only offer for a civilian death that has been made during that time. And in this case, the 15000 just to give you a sense, it was for his wife and daughter only. That is— even higher than what they ordinarily offer, which is usually capped at 2500 per death. Did it have something to do with you being there? Actually, Bassem, I'm sorry, excuse me, Anand was actually in the meeting with them. Anand, describe that meeting and your participation in it. Yeah, I went with Bassem to the meeting at the Erbil airport, and uh, we didn't exactly know how much they would offer, although we expected that it's not going to be high. Um, and in the meeting, they, the um, JAG officials uh, explained uh, that the offer they were going to make wasn't a offer of compensation, but of condolence. And it was an important difference, because the U.S. military is not in the business of compensating uh, civilians who've lost uh, things, because, of course, the problem is, if they, from their perspective, if they feel they, they can they start compensating people for what they've lost, then they're going to start having to pay out hundreds of millions of dollars, and it would impede their very ability to, to wage a, a war. So instead, it's uh, an offer of condolence, ultimately with the idea of not uh, having Iraqis upset at them. That's. <laughs> That's and now, yeah. what's been the reaction uh, by the U.S. military, by the coalition, since your article came out? Well, almost nothing, actually. We've been waiting uh, to hear something from them. You know, we gave them all of our essential findings way before the article was published, um, three or four weeks before, and asked them for comment on each specific individual allegation that was made in the piece, and we haven't heard a thing. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Our guests are Asma Khan and Anand Gopal, co-authors of the New York Times magazine cover story called The Uncounted. Basim Razo is joining us from Erbil, Iraq, who lost his wife, daughter, brother and nephew during a U.S. airstrike on his home in Mosul, Iraq, in 2015. We'll be back with them in a moment. <laughs> The Descent by Kayam Alahmi. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. 
I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we continue to spend the hour looking at a damning new report that reveals how U.S.-led airstrikes against Islamic State militants in Iraq have killed far more civilians than officials have acknowledged. The Pentagon claims 466 civilians have been killed in 89 airstrikes since 2014. But an on-the-ground investigation by The New York Times magazine titled The Uncounted found the actual civilian death toll is much higher than the U.S. is admitting. In fact, the report reveals that as many as one in five coalition airstrikes on ISIS targets in Iraq uh, resulted in civilian deaths. The reporters write, quote, to understand how radically different our assessment is from the coalition's own, consider this. According to the coalition's available data, 89 of its more than 14,000 airstrikes in, result have in Iraq have resulted in civilian deaths, or about one of every 157 strikes. Uh, the rate we found on the ground, one out of every five, is 31 times as high. For, for more, we're joined by the two reporters who co-authored uh, this investigation titled The Uncounted. Asmat Khan is an investigative journalist and a Future of War fellow at New America and Arizona State University. And Anand Gopal is an assistant research professor at Arizona State University and the author of No Good uh, no Good Men Among the Living. Also with us is Bassam Razo in Erbil, Erbil, Iraq, via Democracy Now! video stream. Bassam Razo, I'd like to begin with you. We, in, in our headlines today, we talked about the, uh, the trillion—and oh, uh, I understand that he is in the dark right now, because the electricity has gone out in his city, uh, but his line is still working with us. Uh, I'd like to ask you uh, the— in our headlines, we reported that the United States is going to end up spending trillions of dollars just in interest on all of the over the next decades on all of the military uh, uh, the uh, interventions in Iraq and Syria. Uh, I'm wondering when you hear this enormous amount of funds, and yet you find that you are one of the few people, uh, uh, civilians, who suffered from a U.S. airstrike that's actually been offered. Any kind of uh, any kind of payment. Your reaction when you hear there's enormous sums spent and yet so little that the United States is setting aside for the victims of its uh, of its mistaken attacks. I think his his light has just come on. Yes, it just come on. Uh, well, really, it's very upsetting uh, because uh, actually the first time uh, I heard that the civilian life of an Iraqi killed. It was $2,000, dollars which was really, really upsetting. I felt it was degrading. Uh, and I talked to one person. I said, uh, how would you feel? Uh, like if you are in, a, in an airplane accident in the United States uh, and uh, you lost somebody you love life and the airline will give you $2,500 for it. He said, I would be outraged. I said, how do you think I feel? I will, my wife, daughter, brother, and nephew were killed by an airstrike. They were uh, innocent civilians, and now they offered me 15,000 15, for two, two people. It was, I was outraged, really, by this amount. Very, very upset. Um, Anand Gopal, can you talk about the effect of this on Iraq, the far more, um, far greater number of civilians killed um, than the U.S. is willing to admit, as it uh, says it is routing out ISIS, the so-called Islamic State? Yeah, it, um, the U.S. has effectively defeated ISIS, but at the cost of destroying whole cities and leaving thousands, if not tens of thousands of families completely broken. Uh, Mosul is an example in which uh, at least half of the city of Mosul is nearly in rubble. And uh, these aren't accidents uh, in, the, in the sense that we would normally think about it. These are policy decisions. For instance, in Mosul, uh, the city of Mosul was surrounded, and uh, civilians and, uh, and ISIS fighters were not allowed to leave the city uh, in an exit corridor, which was one of the conditions which uh, induced ISIS to take civilians hostage and led to in, in extraordinary numbers of civilian casualties. And, and Asma, you mentioned that you, your, your, your study area was East Mosul, but really some of the worst damage was in West Mosul. And you think that the 
the casualty figures may actually be much higher than even your uh, your study shows. Yes, not just because we didn't include West Mosul, but also because these airstrikes that we were surveying, the 103 in that sample, occurred before a rule change that started last December uh, under President Obama that authorized more ground commanders to be able to call in and approve airstrikes. And many believe that this was one of the reasons why we saw a spike in civilian casualties uh, from these airstrikes. But I, I also want to point out uh, you know, what we've found to be a lack of ability to investigate properly um, by the coalition. What we found repeatedly during the course of our investigation is not just that they weren't uh, necessarily locating evidence or verifying evidence uh, for allegations, but also that they sometimes lacked the information to even determine sometimes whether an airstrike was a coalition airstrike or their own. Um, in, in the 103 coordinates and, and even more than that, that we passed on, um, we were told sometimes that, you know, listen, this was this particular airstrike was not us. It's unlikely to be us. The nearest airstrike we carried out was as far as 600 meters away. But then we would find coalition videos uploaded by the coalition itself showing those airstrikes in the places that we had uh, pinpointed or in that area. And when we followed up about it, we were told, we can only tell you what the log shows. And we, we had this happen on several occasions. And what it shows you is that their logs are incomplete or what they're searching is incomplete. And the number one reason that they cite when they deny a civilian casualty allegation is that they have no record of a coalition airstrike taking place in a geographic area. And that casts doubt on their credibility investigations so far. Have they taken down all these YouTube videos? They took down videos from YouTube. These videos still— and. To distinguish, they still exist on other military websites, but YouTube was the one place where people could comment. So, but so in other words, to follow up on this, you, what you're suggesting is that the the actual record keeping, the logs of where the attacks occurred, are uh, sometimes incorrect, which could either mean one, uh, just sloppy uh, lock keeping by the soldiers involved, or deliberate, <laughs> uh, deliberate uh, reports of the wrong coordinates for an attack. Yeah, it really is troubling that these records were not kept in a way that was conducive to accurately investigating or investigating properly, because what we were told when we visited when I visited Qatar and I went to the 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 Combined Air Operations Center is that we have 100 percent authority over where we drop our weapons. We know exactly where they're landing. And that turned out, in some cases, not to be true. The U.S. military says it's the most uh, precise war and targeting that they have ever engaged in. We only have a minute, and we want to give that minute um, to the focus of your story, though you tell many, um, as we uh, talk about what has happened to Bassem Razo. Your final comment, your message to the world, Basim? Uh, well, I want to add just one more thing in this one minute. Just like Azmet said, because there was no exit corridor for ISIS, they were forced to stay in the city and fight. And uh, the excessive use of force, because some, probably one member of ISIS will be on top of a roof of a building. Just remember uh, Azmet, the guy we met from a Leila family. There were two members, ISIS, on his roof, and the whole house was bombed. This was excessive use of force. Uh, I, my friends in Mosul told me of really precision bombing on small cars, and only the car will be hit. But when you— We have 10 seconds. To kill one person, yeah, to kill one person you do demolish a whole house. This is really terrible. Uh, I'm sorry for all the loss that has happened. I really would like the Americans— uh, to restudy their strategy. We're going to have to leave it there. Thinking. I thank you so much for oh, being with you. us. Basim Raza yeah. from Erbil, Iraq, and Asma Khan and Anand Gopal. We will link to their story, um, The Uncounted. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.